Mind Body Dictionary chat today. I'm here with Ronald Wayman, and this week's topic is finding inner strength while dealing with outer chaos. Um, the world is changing. There is a lot of uh, different things happening, things we're not accustomed to, and that can feel like chaos. It can look like chaos. And while going through that, whether it's just the world's chaos or perhaps in your own life, community, whatever it might be. Um, how do we find that inner the inner calm when dealing with this external stuff? So Ron, hi. Well, good. And I appreciate that, Denise. Uh, it's good to be here with you and how to, how to deal with this uh, world of chaos. I think it's always been a little chaotic in the world at some sort, but the major chaos and wars and that uh, are very troubling, and that's what a lot of people are afraid of. But how to find inner strength to the chaos? Um, <clears throat> what I have always done is looked at if if I'm in a chaotic state, which I've been at different times in my life for different reasons, and as <clears throat> not only do I want to look at Am I in fear or am I in panic or am I in anger? Uh, I want to go to some of the uh, sources of that. You know, where, where's the pattern of that? So <clears throat> that's one, one way to do it is just, you know, find where it came from uh, originally. And then there's another one besides that. And um, what drives me to go forward so what so there's the driver that goes forward what's behind that and the and the one that pulls me back so you have those two uh considerations and um <clears throat> and so the driver sometimes is a little easier to understand um because some people you know they get really adamant like this is uh in the current time frame, there's a big discussion about face masks and things like that. Uh, arguments on either side. Uh, the irony to this is uh, most of the time the driving isn't based on the truth of whether um, what they're talking about. It's more driven by a, a deeper issue, like I, you know, I don't want to be controlled or I want my freedom, or uh, other people ought to, need to respect me, right? And uh, they should they should have respect, or those the, those people are stupid, and they need to be taught a lesson. Uh, whatever is there, that driver, if it becomes too strong, then it supersedes any truth or anything that is uh, um, more of wisdom. And so then then it creates a rebellion creates fighting creates uh, disturbances creates chaos it's because in the chaotic world if we're driven out of anger um, frustration then and then it supersedes the other and that's on the driver's side go ahead you were going to say something denise you had, did you have a comment or a question sure so when you say driver you know um, some you're talking about being driven by anger or things like that. Wouldn't it fear be a part of that? Being driven by fear? Yeah. Um, if you're driven by fear, fear actually is a contraction. You go inward, where anger it goes out. Like you think of a vol volcano. Volcano would be more of an anger, and then a whirlpool or tornado. You know, it goes goes in now. Tornado is really interesting or a hurricane because it is going in and then it's creating so many so much chaos. Yeah. So okay. that's when the fear turns into a panic, right? Uh -huh. So fear, like anxiety and all that, all of a sudden I'm in panic. And so I'm a destroyer. I'm just everything around me. Mm -hmm. um, and so fear drives us, but it, it starts internal. Mm -hmm, for sure. So if if someone's in panic, they first need to find safety, or else it, it won't. It doesn't matter what happens. So that's why we we can go into breathing patterns. We can do something to 
really bring us home, mindfulness techniques. But I tell you, when I went through a lot of pain, when I broke my wrist, um, and there was just an intense amount of pain, um, uh, I had to actually do the opposite. Instead of finding peace, I needed to find my chaos. I needed to find what was driving that. And uh, so I actually sped my breath up. I sped it up and not a fire breath that they do in yoga where it's a forced breath. It was just a shorter breath. Just to catch up to what I was doing. And once I caught up to it and I, it didn't take too long, then I slowed it down. Then I went back to the speed, the, the shorter breath, and I slowed it down. Rather than think, oh, I've just got to, I got to settle down. In a real panic, you can't, there's no way to settle down because it's completely based on survival. Um, <clears throat> and and where where is all that coming from? You know, that driver, like you mentioned, that the one that pulls, drives you to pull in and rather than push out. Well, part of that's based upon uh, ancestral stuff, meaning my parents, my grandparents, their famines, their wars, there's, I guess you go back far enough, pestilences and stuff like that. And, <clears throat> and so it's innately there that we don't want to starve. We don't want to be destroyed. So when we get in panic, we're really pulling brainstem uh, memories. But it could be something like, for example, on mine, uh, I uh, pulled a ligament and uh, had a cast several years ago when I was uh, 20, I turned 21, and it brought up all those memories. And so I, uh, once I caught that, oh, there was a lot going on at that time, a lot of transition. And so I just connected the two in my own personal history. So I did a personal history look at that. That's one thing I did. And the other thing I, I did for the panic is just realize that when there's enough pain, it will automatically go to old memories that were in our ancestors that get passed on. A lot of people don't believe that. They say, oh yeah, what happened to my ancestors has nothing to do with, well, it has everything to do with it. Everything to do with our experience. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> this well, one- I mean how did we get afraid of spiders? How did we end up afraid of snakes? How did we end up afraid of, you know, there's some illogical, you know, fears that we have. It makes no sense, you know, sharks or whatever. I, I was in a lake and that's how I discovered I was afraid of sharks. It made no sense. <laughs> no sharks in the lake, right? No sharks in a lake, which really helps because you're like, this is a completely irrational fear, you know? <laughs> but you feel it anyway. And, and I know that I have ancestors that had, you know, there was a, an event with some sharks, you know, it, it was, actually it's our ancestor, right? Like it's a mutual ancestor. Do you know that story? It's a great story. Which one? On so a shark one? One of, our, one of our ancestors on the Wayman side, he was riding on the boat across the ocean to America. And he was sitting on the side of the, the boat, hanging on to a, do you know this one? We're hanging on to the wire or whatever it was. Uh -huh. He was hanging on to it. And while he was sitting there, he started falling asleep. And he just was sitting, falling asleep. And, you know, and just before he was going to fall into the ocean where sharks actually follow the boat because the, the, the people would die. And then they would throw the people over the boat, over the side of the boat, and then, and then the sharks would eat them, you know, eat their, their remains. And so the sharks just followed the boat waiting for more food, you know. And so there were sharks on the side of the boat, and he, he, just, he was about to fall asleep and fall in because he was falling asleep. And he just startled awake before he had actually fallen. And, you know, it affected him. It's like, oh, my goodness, I could have been eaten by sharks. <laughs> So, whew, I remember reading that story for the first time and just, you know, having that response. But, but anyway, I, I had the fear of sharks in the lake before I knew that story. <laughs> but uh, anyway. So well, that's a really, really good example. That, yeah. That's, and, um, and so, 
that is, I mean, it's good we have those fears, right? Because if we don't have those fears, we do something stupid. Well, like fall asleep. We on all do something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, and I've taught about this. I teach about brain neurology and energy and, and, uh, and how effective neuroscience. And so there's a lot of science on it, but it doesn't matter how much neurology and how much science is applied. We're talking about practical reality here that yeah there's fears and there's angers and there's frustration and and the irony is some people say well i don't have those kind of fears and i don't have those kind of problems and i don't need this kind of stuff well they have something else they 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 have the problem of blocking everything off they don't relate really well at the depth of what people are going through and they can become a tyrant or they can become really stubborn or ornery or uh, of some sort where then you, you have a problem in society that they they determine like a politician energy that is just or a tyrant said this is the rule this is how I see it and there's no other view which causes a lot of problem in our society because there's no discussion yeah. then there's no communication so you have the two extremes people that are too sensitive and then and and too or too hyper and people that are too stubborn and and uh, unwilling to work it out so there's a value to actually looking at um the all of this because if we want to have real joy and real happiness in our life then let's deal with what is what's happening of what isn't real, but we perceive as real. So in a chaotic world, we usually, most people will assume the worst, and then they'll shut down a little bit. And then a few will, will after being shut down, as the energy goes in, then all of a sudden the, they can't handle it. And then they explode in anger and causes and zealousy and, and you know, and and they go too far out the other way uh, without thinking about, uh, let's look at the bigger picture here. Um, I was rather impressed recently with the uh, mayor, uh, mayor of the city who, when there were so many riots, did diff was different than a lot of the mayors. Um, and she said, you know, it's important to speak our truth and what, we feel is our right to say but if we intentionally go and destroy property and other people's lives that doesn't make what um, make what we're going through right it doesn't bring truth it just makes us like them we become the enemy yeah. and i was very proud of her she stood up and and was speaking truth whereas opposed to some others they either hid some mayors hid or others uh you know uh, were uh, in support of the riot so to speak it's kind of odd um actually um so how does that apply in a home you know how does that apply in a personal life is it really good question when there's chaos there's fear and and uh frustration and um how do we apply this what do you think Denise? when there's external stress in the home and dealing with the internal side is that the question sure um well we have talked about this a little bit in some of the other discussions we've had um when you know i think there was one well i don't know if it's all all published yet but where there's the bear you know and the the bear gets angry and upset and and growly you know in the home and um you know when it's appropriate to deal with that situation which isn't in the time when they're grizzly style but more in a time when they're calm the rational is back on board and when both can remain calm while talking about sensitive topics sensitive subjects So, um, <clears throat> so if 
I mean, this happens a lot. Someone ha is sensitive to something, gets upset, and the response from the other individual could be like a bear saying, no, we don't talk about that. You're wrong. Mm -hmm. um, or it could be like a little rabbit just bounce around. You know, whenever the subject's brought up, they just go, oh, I just can't handle it. Why are you, you know, just, or a little bird, you know, like, flutter around, right? Yeah. Or it could be like a tiger just waiting for the other person to say certain words and then pounce. You know, just ready to say, you're always thinking that way. You're just, you're, you know, you, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what's another one? Could be um, could be the pity one, um, where um, what animal would that be? <laughs> I can't. All of a sudden, I can't think of an animal, but it'd be. Oh yeah, you're so it's sad, and you know, right? Yeah. And uh, and there's like, the, what's that? <laughs> Not quite sloth. What would it? I don't know. Well, the sloth is just kind of. <laughs> it's there, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> kind of lazy, it's not, right? It's Let's not do anything about it. <laughs> um, well, and then there's the camel, and just kind of, yeah, yeah, live stuff, yeah, just, or giraffe, right? Just kind of right there. Uh -huh. um, but in any case, doing it spontaneously here. Yeah. It, in, Whatever the whatever the response, whether it's a perfectionistic spot, response that won't allow, you know, just a really rigid response from the other person, or too much pity, or too much hyper, anything that isn't based upon, hey, I'm listening to you, um, I'm I'm really hearing what you're saying, whether or not it's valid or not, it's just. Uh, the ability to have the other individual in the home be able to sit there and not get overwhelmed themselves because mm -hmm. any response that is out of anger or out of fear or panic means that the responder can't handle it. They're in overwhelm. Yeah. And if I said that to someone who's stubborn and rigid, they go, oh, I'm not in overwhelm. Well, then why can't you just relax and let the other person have their their view, let them have their emotional response, let them have, you know, their meltdown. I've had meltdowns before, you know, when I got the pain that caused the meltdown. Like, oh my goodness, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Let the other person have the meltdown. But if I, as a responder, cannot handle it, and I have to either be rigid, mean, fearful, panic, competitive to it, then I need to learn how to deal with the with the crisis and the crisis um, um, is not really a crisis most of the time it's the other individual trying to figure it out they've gone back to their childhood memories or ancestral reflexes and they just need a moment they just need to understand and I did this with the granddaughter uh, the other day and, and my, my daughter does really good with my granddaughter. She, she does this also, but it was a great opportunity for me to practice. I'm not perfect at it, but I, I do it. I do it all, all the time with clients, of course. And just let the granddaughter speak her, you know, she's just a little thing. And she started to speak her feelings and, and how she got hurt. And she created a plan and my daughter's been really well to help her learn how to, when there's a problem, let's have a plan to come out of it. Mm -hmm. And I just listened, and because I listened, she was able to tell me her plan next time, not to do what she did. She fell down and got hurt and things like that. And she, so her plan was to be more careful and watch. I didn't tell her the plan, she told me the plan. And I, I was quite impressed how this little little human was able to, as long as she was given space, was able to talk through, ouch, it hurts, and I'm sad, and I'm upset, and next time I'm gonna do this and this and this. And, and then I asked after she talked her plan out, if it hurt as much, she says, no, it doesn't hurt as much 
I said, why? Because I know what to do. And, and I, I credit my daughter for doing a, a lot of that over and over again with her. But it's a, it's a really good that plan for all of us as, a, as a, someone in a, in a home to when someone's in crisis mm -hmm. or trouble, be able to be safe enough internally and be calm enough to let someone else talk it through. Let them work through their fear. Let yeah. them work through their anger. anger. It, it isn't very hard to do. It's actually the easiest thing to do. The easiest thing to do is be patient, be understanding, be open, and be capable of allowing the person to walk through it. Now, some people, obviously, they spin. They spin their logic over and over again. I understand that. And, and when they go to spin it and have enough courage to say, now, is this repetitive of what you just said earlier? Are we just going around in circles without saying, oh, you're just saying the same thing and being angry about it. But to have the safety enough for them and for yourself to see, oh, I'm just spinning. Um, our society spins in circles like crazy. We repeat history all the time. Every day as a whole earth, we repeat history and we spin and we do it in our personal life. We do it in our family lives. Um, we repeat over and over again. Um, um, I, I know these great causes, they say, well, you know, these people matter and those people matter and this, all that. Well, if you go back thousands of years ago, those same people, the roles were reversed. Okay, long time ago, if you go back, 4,000 years ago, some things were actually reversed the other way. So you, whenever we think there's an injustice, we need to stop and say, yes, there is. The injustice is what we do to ourselves. We do it to ourselves by the way we think, the way we feel and judge others and, and not taking the time to say, most people are just stuck in a story. Let's stop. Yeah. Let's really start to heal our lives by, by finding a safe place within that gradually has a plan to work through our anger, our frustration, our fear, and, and build, build plans how to change our, our, our situations. They're not based upon violence or upon panic. So I know there's a little bit of a spill there, but any yeah. comment you have? Well, it's like a pendulum swing, you know, it's, you know, this injustice swing over to the exact same injustice just now reversed, you know, and that I think that's the same with the male, female, feminist kind of stuff, you know, it's, there's similar injustices, but now reversing it and, and do we expect that to work long term? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that I think it's important, like you're saying, to acknowledge the injustice and say, yes, that was wrong. Do we want to repeat it right away with in a new package? Um, and what you're suggesting from what I'm hearing is, is there's actually a third solution. You know, we don't have to, we don't have to swing the pendulum back and forth and back and forth, but we can actually be reflective and say, okay, well, let's, let's rather than, than, you know, punching back and saying that was rude. I didn't like that that happened. We really, deal with that inner chaos in a responsible way and um and resolve it within ourselves and then there's no need to you know punch back there's a and an, it's okay to embrace a peaceful route without revenge or upset uh, <clears throat> revenge will only seed will be the seed for more problems mm -hmm. Revenge never, ever, ever solves a problem. Doesn't matter. Even if in the old days, you know, those old kingdoms and kings, so, uh, uh, invaders would go ahead and kill the king, the queen, and all the kids, but it'll come back to them. They'd be invaded. If they were not, then their children's 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 children would. It just, I mean, it's just like that. Um, um, and they, karma is what karma does and and, and so it's going to happen and so it's time to actually do true heartfulness and mindfulness and uh let the ego 
that that you know is in survival all the time start working with the heart and the mind start working with a true a true soul and uh, uh, I'm working on uh, taking some of the work of uh, some of the archetypes uh, that have been mentioned in literature and take, you know, there's lots of stories relating it to uh, the organs of the body and, uh, and to the chakra fields. And, um, and, and uh, I've, once again, as I look at it, once again, I'm just so, uh, amazed that I mean it's been this way from the beginning of time. This this set of archetypes that we live, and if we want to move through life and enjoy life, then we start listening. We start listening to an inner voice, an inner source, and coming back to living a whole life. Meaning all the archetypes we have in us. We all have a ruler. We all have little little orphan inside we all have um, <clears throat> um, someone who wants to go and seek and have an adventure honor all parts of ourselves in an integrated fashion and then wow life starts to change life becomes quite quite the adventure in a very positive way otherwise you know if we expect everybody else to change and uh, now it's gonna it's not going to do it. It's just that's a materialistic world, expecting that the material world on the outside is going to be different. So. Yeah, the expectations of everyone else to be perfect or to change or both so that we don't have to because <laughs> it's hard work, darn it. Yeah, um, I want to go back a little bit. I mean, it still relates to what you said just now, but um, to where you were saying uh, being calm while someone else is just expressing their feelings and their thoughts and that kind of thing. Um, and your granddaughter who was, you, you know, you were able to hold that, that for her, that space for her while she processed through her pain and, and her feelings and what she was going to do next, which is very cute. Um, it reminded me of something I saw really recent um, on Little House of the Prairie, which is like an oldie, but a goodie. Oh, let's watch that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, it, it's, all, it's free on Amazon Prime right now, so... So it's, uh, the kids are thinking it's great and we're, we're saying, okay, that's an okay one. But it's interesting to think, you know, where did we get some of these patterns of response that we have, you know, to be defensive, to not let someone, you know, just feel whatever they're feeling because it's not okay, you know? And, and I've thought that a lot. I'm like, what, what was this? Well, Little House of the Prairie gives a lot of insights into that question. <laughs> because, so one example, um, there's a, a family, the father had died and the mother finds out that she is very ill and will be dying soon so the kids are soon to be orphans and so she tells her children and the oldest begins to cry he's very sad that he's about to be orphaned and she gets mad she says don't you dare cry you are crying for yourself you are being selfish you know, that is not okay, you know, <laughs> and she, she, you, you suck up those tears right now, and he, you know, he had, he was flowing, he was devastated, and, you know, and he just put it back together like this, and I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> like, that just happened, <laughs> and, you know, pretty overall, uh, House and Perry does a good job of, you know, showing responsible character, you know, and that was one thing that we respected about it was like, oh, okay, it's showing responsible character, you know, when people are being awful, you stand up for yourself, but you don't, you know, just swing the bat again, you know, they had some good stuff there. But when I saw that one, I was like, that explains a lot about, you know, holding, she didn't want him to feel because she feels a lot too, but she doesn't want to have to feel what she's feeling, you know? Correct. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah. Also, also, not only did she not want to feel hers, she didn't want him to be weak. So the positive intention on that was she wanted, she thought that to go forward, you had to be tough. And, uh, you know, most people teach that. They, they all, uh, no, excuse me. Yeah, they, they, but in the pre, you know, several years ago and decades ago, it was just that way. Don't cry. Don't be weak. Be tough otherwise you you won't survive the the validity of that um is is that if we stay in a pitiful state like really sad 
it is difficult to actually take action every day if we're a victim all the time. Yeah. The problem with that is what? What's the problem with this always, I have no feeling I'm gonna go forward. What's the problem become, with that? You become inauthentic. You become, you have lack of compassion. You, you're, you know, you could have a tight chest. You could have tight shoulders. You could get angry. You know, you could be, um, uh, I don't know about past feeling, but, but, but you're shoving that pain in and it can, and then it's actually going to do damage inside. It will. In fact, in relationships, what happens is when someone, you know, does that and the boy grows up possibly doing what his mom said, and then he has children, he can't be really close to the children. Yeah. He loses out on the opportunity to have a beautiful relationship with those children because no, don't want to get too close because you're going to cry, you're going to have feelings. And then some of the children actually fake it. They will fake happy or they will fake feeling because they don't know what feeling is. They don't know what love is, so they fake love. And so then they have a secret life and it's actually one of the causes of addiction, I believe, is addiction is uh, oftentimes like the alcohol and is mo the most famous one, of course, but it could be to drugs or behaviors because I'm, I'm faking happy. I'm faking pleasure because yeah. I don't know the real thing yeah. because it's been stopped somewhere in the generational lines. It was stopped because, oh, you can't be weak. And so to find pleasure, we have to find it in other ways. Because if the mother in that situation could have said, let's cry, even if we cry for 10 minutes, and then we're going to be strong. Do the crying. Now we're going to be strong. And, and tomorrow when you cry again, just do it. Feel it. And then let's come back to strength. We're going to do this. Because if we stay crying all the time, it won't work. But if we stay uh, you know, blank, then we won't have the love. And But she didn't have the training to do I mean, you know. No one's sitting around telling her to do that, right? Yeah. To uh, respect both sides. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and I've had families come in where the daddy's tough, and it could be the mommy's tough. It doesn't matter. Your story was where the mom was tough because, you know, the pain she was having, she didn't want to feel it. She was afraid of him being weak. And then the kid will um, have a lot of anxiety, or the kid will have a secret addiction or the kid will have skin rash. Um, so uh, when I said addictions about that, it's not always the cause of addictions, I understand. And not all the time will addictions come from this on the lines. I'm just giving an, an example. It could be that they have anxiety. A lot of anxiety is I'm not stable and whatever. Oh, I'm afraid of that, I'm afraid of this. And not just being okay and there's a storm out there. All right, just let us breathe and we'll be fine. Anyway. Yeah, recentering, recentering. That's interesting. It is, it is interesting to think about the generational effects of little decisions like that. You know, that's just an instant, but that, you know, you describing how that can affect his kids, his relationship with his kids and their response to him. And then, of course, then they grow up and they have a relationship, you know, and, and oftentimes I look at the world, the chaos that I see in the world today, and I think, this is, you know, minimum four generations old. This is stuff that, you know, people, we haven't dealt with appropriately for generations, partly because like you said, we didn't know how the, you know, they didn't, they didn't have the internet. <laughs> they didn't have, you know, trainers that could get on YouTube and just describe a scenario and like, here's a way to deal with it that's better than just, you know. There was none of that. You know, and, and in, your, in your little place where you have a book. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, they, they did have books. You know, I was surprised how many books were being printed after the printing press came around, mm -hmm. uh, the late 1400s or whenever it was, um, um, or before that. The printing and, press was uh, from the 1800s. What's what that? Your, the printing press? Was that, for, I thought that was 1800s. Oh, no, 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 no. Gutenberg that printed the Bible way back when. Oh, we're, I We're know. talking over... Or 500 years ago, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, books have been around, but they had to be printed individually, and it was expensive, and so it wasn't available to 
most of the classes. Mm -hmm. It was available to the class of the priests and the class of the wealthy. Mm -hmm. And some of the upper middle class, yes, had availability of that. But uh, uh, cookbooks, actually, there were lots of cookbooks that were printed in the 1500s. And um, now I say a lot, and, you know, we're not talking millions, you know, obviously hundreds, but, um, but to them, that was significant. So there have been books, it's just that it hasn't been to all the population. And, um, and they, they've had to process through that information, right? And over time, and some of the information was just people's opinions, just like our opinion right now we're processing information and um some of it is valid and some may not be valid of course because there's no information out there that is a hundred percent accurate at all levels at all times all um and i studied uh, non-euclidean geometry and it's pretty cool because there's some time, some rules that don't apply in all situations and uh, huh. which is another another whole another subject um yeah that's interesting yeah i mean with people there there is no one way to deal with all people in all situations all the time because there's so many relationships back and forth and how i communicate with you uh, may not be the same how i communicate with someone else because they don't have your view they don't have your understanding so of course there's going to be a relationship difference right especially when sure. there's you know, if you say certain words, like uh, poli politically collect correct words to advertise on these social media, if you say a certain word, oh, I can't say that. Nowadays, yep. you've got craziness there on that. But anyway, what were you going to say? Oh, well, you're just, we're, you know, we're on the topic of internal stress and external stress and different ways of interpreting our experience. And there's, there's, you know, with the, with the stuff that's going on today, there's chaos. Let's see, there's a uh, terrain theory versus germ theory, right? Even that one alone has that external versus internal perspective paradigm that shift and both have validity. Um, the, the germ theory being that, you know, you get, you catch a germ, you know, if you coughed at you or something like that, and then that's how you get sick. Um, terrain theory being, well, what gets you sick is your terrain, meaning your, your internal organs, your strength, your health within yourself based on what you've been eating and how you've been handling your stress, both mental, emotional, um, and then of course physical as well. Um, that is what you'll fall into sickness is from not having that internal balance. And then of course, if the, if the external comes and, and lands on a healthy terrain, then it's not as likely to take over. Whereas if the, in, if the external comes and the terrain is not well, then, then it's more likely to take root and get you really sick. And so at the same time, those two theories, you know, both came out. Um, I don't remember on the names of the folks. You probably do. Pasteur. Pasteur. Mm -hmm. Marie and Louis um, Pasteur and, uh, and others. Uh, um, and the arguments that happened back then and the discovery of, uh, uh, you know, the germ theory. And um, a lot of people said they didn't wash hands uh, till a certain time, but I think there were paintings of people washing hands. So the germ theory and terrain theory has been around for, I think, thousands of years. Uh, it's just that science can prove it in history when it started that argument. Um, gotcha. But I think it's been around. Uh, even Jesus said, what comes out of you is more important than what you put in you, because the Jews were very adamant that you, uh, um, the Jewish culture had rules from Moses that you don't put uh, uh, in the ve vessel, in the vase that had uh, what, meat or other milk or other uh, something else in it. And I, I, right now I can't remember the rule because I, uh, it's, it's left me and I feel inadequate on expressing that, that metaphor, but that's been around for a long time that, uh, you know, what, you know, you gotta be careful what you, how you eat, what you eat and all that kind of stuff, as opposed to the other people 
who didn't care, you know, it didn't matter, you know, and, and so, but in recent years, in the past 150, 200 years, where you have the germ theory and the terrain theory, um, the cool thing about that, let's go back to that. I, I want to go back to that. They're both correct. That's what's yeah. so cool about it. Those two yeah. theories are actually both correct. So how could two opposing theories be correct? Where, yeah, there's a bug. Sure, there's protozoas and they're, they're, they're a problem because not only do they eat the bacteria, they spit out bacteria. There's a pretty smart one that works with H. pylori and yeah, can eat it, but also changes H. pylori so our immune system doesn't see it very well. So they farm it, and my, that's my term for it. So you've got these parasites and fungus and bacteria and viruses that are smart yeah. and that manipulate our body and our mind. Huh. So the germ theory actually pretty good, but then they've also noted that in the recent outbreak that all the, uh, that 95% of one, study showed 95% of people who died from a major outbreak of this virus, they had other conditions. They had diabetes and heart conditions and they, they were a certain age and their, their T cells counts were down. And so it wasn't just the virus, it was the fact their body was so sick and had other problems, their immune system couldn't handle it. Yeah. So the terrain was really important on that. And if the terrains were fine, they worked through the virus, most of them, not all of them, but most of them. And um, they were fine. The terrain made a huge difference. So that applies to our emotional state. Mm -hmm. That applies to our families. When we have so many stresses in our life, it is hard to handle one more stress. Yeah. And so yes, stress has come, but if our terrain is balanced, then it's amazing what we can handle. It's really important. That's what the Mind Body Dictionary is about. It is helping you when you have a problem show up that you can look at the emotional side of it so you can deal with your terrain of your life. And then once you deal with the terrain of your life, it's easier to handle those stresses. The Mind Body Dictionary is a very valuable thing. When I had this uh, uh, you know, issue in my own life, and that I looked it up and there it was. We write it, we, oh my gosh. And it applied exactly. And I went, okay, I have to deal with my own stuff. <laughs> and when I do, oh. I'll handle life better. We still have to do it. I still have to, have to face it. I'm very human. Yes. <laughs> um, no, well, and that goes back to that uh, internal stress versus external stress with being in, in the relationships and in that story with that mom and that child. You know, she if she had been in a space where she was able to handle her terrain selfishly according to her mindset the mindset of the time that it was selfish to deal with your own emotion right um, or pay attention to what you were actually feeling um which is perhaps why she she had already shoved her emotion well before she got to her son you know she refused to cry about it too but to shut you know stand up and be strong about it but if she had dealt more appropriately with that that internal terrain, then of course she it would be easier to handle the external, which would be her son um, or other members of the family or the neighborhood or whatever, with whatever their response is, give them the freedom to respond to however they respond. Um, and that's the same with this, this, uh, this world situation that we're in. You know, you, we talk about the governors and the mayors and their responses and people are upset because they're being, you, you know, some of them, not all of them are being, some of them are being very responsible and balanced and some are being a more, um, you know, my way or the highway kind of, kind of attitude. And the response to my way or the hi highway for a lot of people is that anger and frustration and, you know, pushback in a really big way. Um, and I, I don't know what an appropriate response, you know, people are losing businesses and, and are closed down and are having a hard time putting food on the table and that kind of thing. And sometimes I wonder, well, if anger doesn't work, which way do they go? Um, especially in a lined way. Yep. That's part of the whole, the whole question. Yeah. Because if we come out with uh, anger, sometimes people will listen, right? Some people will pay attention when there's a demand. Mm -hmm. uh, so this isn't to say, anger is bad or fear is bad is to say, let's work through it. Let's deal with it. And, 
and be responsible because there is greater force when I am really balanced with my, my head, my heart, my body. And some people would say ego, the soul, the self. There is more, more power because then I can think straight and then I can use the, the positive force of love, of courage, boldness, uh, positive expression than I can when I'm all bull all over the place in any way. So, Is there a um, historical figure that emulates that, Ron? I don't know if you have one on the top of your head that emulates, you know, rather than, um, than responding with anger, responding with that courage, compassion, love, you know, this is just, this is not appropriate, but we're going to respond with firm clarity and alignment. Well, other than Jesus, he's pretty good. Um, <laughs> he's pretty good. <laughs> but um i mean some people come to mind um i i think of abraham lincoln who had phenomenal stress he his cabinet was built with people intentionally that were actually opposers of each other who hated each other but he needed he needed all those bold people to listen to so he could go forward and do what he needed to do i think of jfk um, in many ways, uh, even though there was a rough end for him, he was trying. And yeah. Uh, and yeah, he had a lot of issues and a lot of problems. Gandhi, um, you know, you could, you could look at historical figures that, that they weren't perfect, but they, um, they responded with more boldness, uh, courage, uh, faith, uh, and you could go to, um, um, I mean, you could find them. So that, that's a challenge I give to people to go find them. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, if you are upset about a political figure, then, uh, in your life, then something's off mm -hmm. because there is positive and negative to every leader. Every leader has a positive and negative. And if you can find the positive to someone that you hate, then you have a chance of growing up emotionally and mentally. Doesn't mean you have to vote for that person, but it means that you at least allow some wisdom, have the sage, the, the, the wise person from within have a chance to get to your head. Otherwise, you will want to force your, your opinion and you'll be just like them. You'll be just another dictator. Yeah. That would be in the case of a yeah. home. I have a mother brought, brought in a son who was smoking uh, some weed. This is before weed was popular on the legal side. And she was so adamant we had to force and push this child to obey. And I said, you need to find the good of what he's doing. You need to find something. What's he, where, where's he coming from? She didn't want to. She said, no, 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 no. He, he, he needs to do what I say. And I said, yeah, I think having rules. I, I wasn't, I'm not a favor of people smoking weed all the time because eventually uh, a high percentage of them become lethargic and they don't want to be proactive citizens. I understand I understand the use of it medicinally, and I agree with it for medicinal purposes, not for addictive purposes, though that I'm not in any way, shape, or form agreeing with it. But I'm looking at it why he was rebelling. And so bring up that wisdom so you can communicate, which means you communicate with yourself. That's how you deal with chaos, is you find that side, those sides of you that need healing and understanding. Very cool. Very cool. And that's oh, what my body dictionary is for, is to find out, to figure it out, take a look inside, and, and it'll yep. teach you how to walk, so. I appreciate you uh, bringing this up today. It's been uh, quite enjoyable, so. Yeah, I had a lot of insights, and I appreciate you, uh, your experience to be able to chat with me about it. You bet. Well, thank you, and uh, another day and another time for, for life, huh? Absolutely. Sounds good. We'll talk to you then.